Woohoo! Backpacking season is back. It is time to grab that gear, blow the dust off of it, get it all sorted out, and head back into the wilderness for those amazing adventures that can only come from going deep. Today, we revisit backpacking, how to do it. Episode 367, All Things Backpacking, Part 2. You're listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, brought to you by 180 Tech. We talk with adventurers from around the globe to bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to get started in the outdoors or to keep you moving if you're already there. Now here's your host, Kurt Linville. Check out bikeparts.com for all your cycling gear. They have a wide selection of over 60,000 bike parts and accessories. Need suggestions or have a question about what fits your bike? Their knowledgeable staff will answer any questions and get you rolling as quickly as possible. If you're in the great state of Colorado, stop by their full-service bike shop, Peak Cycles, in downtown Golden. That's bikeparts.com. Hi friends, Kurt here. Hey, this is the second part of a two-part series. This is the All Things Backpacking Flashback Episode Part 2. Part 1 was aired on Monday, so if you want to hear the first part, that's where you find it. This is a return to an episode that we did two years ago, one of the most downloaded episodes of all time. Backpacking season is back upon us, so it's time to dive in and learn more about backpacking. This is the perfect episode for beginners, the perfect episode for people who just want to know whether or not they should try backpacking. Also a great episode for those backpackers who are more polished, who might learn something or might disagree. If you have comments about this episode, please go to adventuresportspodcast.com and let us know what you think. Thank you very much for listening in and happy backpacking. So what else do you do when you're backpacking? So far, we've covered sleeping and how to carry your gear. We need to talk a little bit about footwear because that matters a lot. I have tried a variety of backpacking boots, uh, trail running shoes. I've even tried, you know, sandals for backpacking. And there are a lot of differences of opinion. I will say this, uh, having a backpacking boot that's lightweight and covers your ankles is a real benefit because, you know, you can slip and slide into rocks when you're hiking. People talk about the ankle support that they get out of a boot. I don't know that that's really so true as much as when you're hiking and the side of the boot hits your ankle, it gives your body an early warning system, so you correct the angle of your foot a little bit earlier. But sometimes you can get a little bit of support out of the ankles of of the boots. I'm not sure that a high boot is necessary, but if you do use low hikers or maybe trail running shoes, then a great tip is to use some um, lightweight low gaiters. And even with a a full boot, gaiters can be nice. They keep seeds from grasses out of your boots. They keep rocks out of your boots. If you need to cross water, you can actually kind of run and splash across water and stay almost dry unless you're in something really deep just because the gaiter in the boot will deflect the water as as you dash across it. So there are a lot of advantages to using gaiters even in the summertime. So I would recommend that, especially if you're using some sort of a low top hiker. Some people think that they need a really heavy duty leather hiking boot to go backpacking. And that's not for everyone. Matter of fact, I would even say that it's uh, not for most people. But if you are doing more aggressive mountaineering type stuff, you do have to go to a heavier boot, maybe even a mountaineering boot. But whenever you are backpacking, you need to find a boot that fits you well and uh, one that supports your foot you know if you have a high arch or a low arch you know the width of your foot all this kind of stuff matters you don't want your foot slipping around in your shoe and getting sore unnecessarily sometimes insoles can be bought that will help as well but make sure that you have a fit that works and if you do when you're hiking start getting a, a rub on your foot some sort of a hot spot then Treat it early. Don't wait until it turns into a full-blown, sore, torn-up blister. Blisters are just a part of backpacking, but you can avoid them by wearing proper socks, by stopping and taking care of these hot spots. Even a simple Band-Aid can make a huge difference. Sometimes I'll put a little piece of duct tape inside of my boot to create a slip layer that can help. But one of the best things you can do is just to stop and take off your boots, take off your socks, and air out your feet. I like to soak my feet in a stream as I go by and then let them dry out completely. The most important thing is to get the moisture out of your socks and out of your boots frequently 
so that your feet don't start to turn into a soupy mess down in there. Don't wear cotton socks. Wear some sort of a synthetic or a wool sock that's comfortable for you. But, you know, you need to know which sock to use. I tried a synthetic sock the other day that just destroyed my feet because it was the wrong type of synthetic. So experience goes a long way. But keep those blisters away by finding a boot that doesn't slip around too much, by taking your boots off frequently, by using the right socks. And if you do start to get a hot spot, address it right away. Now, what about in the camp? Sometimes I will take a backpacking sandal with me into the camp if it's lightweight enough. It depends on the kind of trip that I'm doing. Um, I don't like to run around barefoot too much because, you know, pine sap sticks all over your feet. You can step on thorns or sometimes even a piece of glass. You don't want to get injured when you're on the trail. So I either wear my boots or I can wear a sandal. Don't take flip-flops because they get wet in the dew or in a creek. They twist on you and it's just a great way to get injured. So make sure you have have a firm-fitting sandal that you can wear even wet securely if you decide to take something. Now, often, I don't take anything. Instead, when I get to camp, I'll tie my boots loosely enough that I can slip them on and off easily without having to tie them, and then I can use that for getting in and out of the tent and roaming around camp. Of course, don't walk on uneven ground with untied boots. That's another way to uh, to get an injury, which you don't want to do. But it is a, a quick way to avoid having to carry the sandals in, but sometimes it's worth it, depending on the trip, to have a camp sandal. So remember, we're going through what we do during a normal day, and specifically during a day of backpacking. So far, we've taken care of footwear, we've taken care of carrying your load, we're, we have taken care of your sleep system. You also need to think about first aid and sun protection and thermal protection. Um, the temperatures do vary wildly, and the weather can change unexpectedly, and especially in the West, you can have temperature changes of 40 degrees or more in a matter of minutes. So I recommend that you always take a way to stay dry and a way to insulate with you in the pack. It's a little bit of extra weight to carry, but it is worthwhile. You should have at least one pair of insulating long pants. I'm not talking about jeans. I'm talking about something lighter and more insulating. Fleece pants or some sort of a light lightweight synthetic sweat pant or something like that that you can use to insulate. And then it's also a great idea to have some sort of a lightweight rain shell so that you can keep your legs dry, especially if there's a, a freak windy rainstorm or icy rainstorm, God forbid. These things really matter. You should have a fleece that you can wear on your upper body and a lightweight shell and that gives you the opportunity to uh, stay dry and cool or dry and warm or warm without having to have the shell if it's not raining so make sure that you have those things you need to have a hat to keep the sun off your face and neck and sometimes i'll use a ball cap but that is not adequate so i put a bandana in the cap so it hangs over my ears and the back of my neck that's not too bad for sunscreen but a full hat like a cowboy hat or something a backpacking hat that has a full brim all the way around it uh, is really good for keeping the sun off your face i have taken to hiking in a lightweight thin long-sleeved collared shirt and the reason is the collar keeps the sun off my neck i can unbutton the front of it while i hike so it stays very cool and that part of my body is shaded and i keep the cuffs unbuttoned and it keeps my arms covered so i don't get a sunburn on my arms that way i don't have to slather up with sunscreen all over my body and, and have that sweat sticky sunscreen feeling now if you do use sunscreen so be it that's fine. You can do that, but whatever you do, make sure you have a way to keep from getting a severe burn. Keep in mind, you're going to be outside in and out of the shade, so you might not even notice that you're burning, but you're going to be outside for hours and hours and hours. So you need a way to protect yourself from the exposure to the sun. Take a first aid kit with you, and it does not have to be heavy. You can learn a lot of first aid skills. I mean, you can... Uh, create crutches and splints and all sorts of things from nature all around you. So you don't have to carry a lot of heavy stuff, but you should have some basic gauze and bandages, some tape. You should have some Neosporin. When it comes to first aid in the woods, I like to know enough skills that I can take care of the big emergencies by using natural materials around me, and I can take care of the smaller emergencies like blisters or cuts or scrapes um, using what I have in my pack. 
You also need to make sure that you have some way to protect yourself from the bugs that are going to be in the area where you are. Usually we're talking about mosquitoes, ticks, chiggers. Uh, occasionally you need to worry about a wasp or something like that. But the reality is it's usually mosquitoes in Colorado are the biggest issue. And bug spray, <laughs> there's nothing better than just using some DEET. There are all sorts of natural bug sprays out there. They do work, but for a very short period of time. I think it's worthwhile to take some DEET with you. Another thing that I do that really helps is I have a bandana with me on every backpacking trip. I use it as a rag to wash with. I use it as as a cloth to protect myself when I handle hot things off the fire. I use it as my sunscreen when I need to cover up part of my body. I mean, there's uh, uh, dozens of different uses, but one of them is um, I'll hang it over my shoulder. And as the bugs start to buzz around me, if they're not too bad, then I'll just kind of wave my bandana around like a horse uses his tail, and it keeps the bugs away. And so that's a little bit of a pain, but if the bugs aren't too bad, I find that that's adequate, and then I don't have to put on the the bug spray. But definitely take some bug spray. If the bugs get out of control, it's worth it. I also, like I said, have mosquito netting that I can wear if I have to. You've got to make sure you're covered well when you sleep. Because then, when you're sleeping, you're not very good at defending yourself. On a backpacking trip to Lost Creek Wilderness, one of my sons was sleeping under a tarp with me, and he had mosquito netting over his head, just like I recommended. And I woke up in the morning, looked over at him, and there are about six mosquitoes inside of the mosquito netting, because he hadn't cinched it down around his neck enough. And so, poor guy, couldn't win for losing on that one, so... Think about it, you know, if you're using mosquito mosquito netting, make sure that it is closed up properly and enjoy yourself, have fun. You know, mosquitoes, they're a, a big annoyance and there are some things in backpacking that are annoying. These discomforts all have solutions and the biggest solution for all of them is probably to just not worry so much about it. Take everything down a notch, take a deep breath and say, it's okay. Little by little, you can build up tolerance for different temperatures, for hard places to sit. You can build up tolerance for dealing with bugs and that sort of thing. It's largely attitude. It also is the decision to not get frustrated by everything. Just let it flow and it'll be okay. Let's spend just a little bit more time on clothing. I already talked about thermal insulation, but what kind of clothes should you wear? Keep in mind that you're going to have to protect yourself from the elements, but also you want things to be lightweight. So I really like a lot of the lightweight synthetic backpacking gear that's coming out these days. It's a little pricey, but boy, this stuff's nice. It's thin, yet it protects you. Really light. And the bottom line is you don't need to take that much in the way of clothing. You can wash clothes, at least rinse them off really well on the trail and use them over and over again. I normally have a pair of shorts, a pair of long pants, one shirt that's short-sleeved, one shirt that's long-sleeved, and then I'm going to have my fleece and shell and hat. And uh, I do bring extra socks. you got to keep socks clean and nice to protect your feet, and of course, enough undies for the trip. But you don't need that much in the way of clothing. Just enough to stay warm. Don't worry about putting on different clothes every day. Like I said, you can rinse clothes off as you go, and that way you save a lot of weight. Let's visit a little bit about first aid. It's obviously important to be able to take care of emergencies when you're in the wilderness. And there are uh, different types of first aid classes that can be taken so that you have the knowledge to be useful in an emergency. Of course, one of the most popular would be the wilderness first aid class. There's a wolfa and the wolfer, which is a first responder class. And both of these classes provide you with a lot of great information on what to do in a medical emergency in the wilderness. But even without that class, you should get some basic understanding of of what to do about various things. But what can you carry with you? Hmm. When it comes to first aid, you could carry a ton of stuff. But of course, no one wants to carry a ton when they're backpacking. So... Here's what I do. I'm not sure that you should follow my rec- my recommendation. Rather, I think that you should come up with a, a first aid kit that you're comfortable with mixed with the amount of knowledge that you have. And the reason I say it that way is a lot of emergency situations can be handled using stuff that you have on hand without having to carry it in as a first aid item per se. So I tend to lean on that based on my knowledge and experience. So what I take with me is a 
basic cuts and scratches first aid kit. So for me, that means I'm going to have some antibiotic ointment. I'm going to use usually rubbing alcohol as an antiseptic. It may not be the best antiseptic, but it's decent. And I use rubbing alcohol for a plethora of tasks when I'm in the wilderness. I take just a couple ounces of it with me. It can be used as fire starter if necessary. You can uh, use it to help uh, treat the itching from bug bites. You can cleanse wounds with it. You can uh, use it even as a deodorant. It does a great job of, of keeping the stink away. If there's no water to wash in around, then I even use rubbing alcohol just to uh, cleanse my face and stuff like that so I stay fresh. So anyway, a couple ounces of rubbing alcohol is uh, very useful because of all the different purposes that you can use the rubbing alcohol for. So once again, I have some antibiotic ointment. I have some rubbing alcohol. I'm going to have Band-Aids, of course. Something to treat blisters is a, is a really good idea to carry along. I like to take some gauze and some tape. And then for larger emergencies, I know that I can make a stretcher out of natural things that are found, you know, at hand in the wilderness. I can make splints for broken legs or sprained ankles. I can make crutches and canes. There are all sorts of things that can be fashioned from the the materials that are in the woods for larger emergencies. So the main things are to know what to do for bleeding, for shock, for severe sunburns or, or other types of burns. Know how to treat those sorts of things without necessarily having to carry an ambulance into the woods with you, right? Remember, when you're going into the wilderness, you are taking some risk in that you are removing yourself from all of the things that that civilization or society offers for emergency services. That means you do need to be a little bit uh, self-reliant, and that requires skill and practice. But again, it's all part of the fun. It's part of the hobby worthwhile to learn some of these first aid skills. Other things I like to take from a first aid standpoint include aspirin, ibuprofen, some sort of an antihistamine if you have some sort of a bad histamine reaction. That can be really useful. And I think it goes without saying that if you are taking medications for high blood pressure or things like that that you need on a daily basis, uh, make sure that you don't forget those and leave those at home. That really matters. Everybody needs to tailor their own medication kit, their own first aid kit to their knowledge level. And, you know, my first aid kit probably weighs less than two ounces. With a kit like mine, you may not have everything that you might want for larger emergencies. But like I mentioned, you can fashion a lot of things out of what's at hand in the wilderness around you as well. So I think key, make sure you have the basics. You don't want to be out in the woods and have some uh, scrapes and cuts and and burns and things like that and not have a way to deal with those things because then smaller problems can become larger problems if you get infections or things like that. So I keep it pretty simple, pretty basic, but you need to make sure you do take at least what you need. And I should mention as part of the first aid kit, and this goes for almost every category, have a roll of duct tape. It doesn't have to be big and heavy. Sometimes I will even just wrap duct tape around a hiking stick so that I have a good length of it with me. And the idea behind the duct tape is that you can use it to fashion splints and to fashion stretchers and to repair broken gear. You can use it to help ward off blisters. There's so many uses for duct tape and first aid is one of them. Check out bikeparts.com for all your cycling gear. They have a wide selection of over 60,000 bike parts and accessories. You can find everything you need, including tires, chains, tools, frame bags, cycling apparel, and even complete bicycles. They've got established brands like Shimano, SRAM, and Campagnolo, as well as the latest and greatest products from brands like Wolftooth, Physic, Zip, and Raceface. Need suggestions or have a question about what fits your bike? Their knowledgeable staff will answer any questions and get you rolling as quickly as possible. If you're in the great state of Colorado, stop by their full-service bike shop, Peak Cycles, in downtown Golden. Check out bikeparts.com. 
As I'm sure you know from listening to the Adventure Sports Podcast, some of the safest and best snow conditions for backcountry skiing of the whole year happen in the springtime. And Bent Gate has the gear you need. Come check out the latest in Alpine Touring, Telemark, NTN, and Splitboarding gear. They have brands like Black Crows, DPS, Dinafit, G3, Icelandic, K2, Technica Blizzard, Arcteryx, Mammoth, Solomon, Vole, Never Summer, Jones, and BCA. And you do need to be safe out there. Bentgate has the latest in avalanche safety gear. They have beacons, airbags, shovels, and probes, and they're ready to help you educate yourself on snow safety. They also rent out gear, so you can get your skis and your boots there, as well as your avalanche safety equipment. What's more, they also have free demo ski days at local resorts, so you can try out the latest gear. Now, how much fun does that sound? So swing by Bentgate in Golden, Colorado. Or go to bentgate.com to find your new gear, as well as to get updates on all of their events. So where are we on our what do we do in a day list? This is the way that I pack my backpack. And so far, we've covered footwear, we've covered the pack, we've covered the sleep system, we've covered the clothing and the first aid, and we've covered protecting yourself from the elements. We've covered taking care of yourself against the bugs and the sun. What's next? We're down to food. Of course, we're going to eat. And that also should remind you that you're going to brush your teeth, you're going to want to wash up, you're going to want to be able to cook your food. So starting with food. You can either select uh, food that you cook, which means you have to have some sort of a backpacking stove to cook with, or you could choose foods that you don't cook. And frankly, I think it's worthwhile to take a stove. The reason is because eating only dry foods like bread, sandwiches, stuff like that, it gets a little bit old after a while. It's so nice, especially on a cool morning, to be able to make a hot cup of coffee or tea. And, and it's also nice to have a hot, nourishing meal at the end of a long day of backpacking. So I think it's absolutely worth it to take a backpacking stove. And of course, I would recommend the 180 stoves that we sell at 180tac.com. These are natural fuel stoves. They're very lightweight. You don't have to buy fuel. You don't have to carry fuel. You just use twigs, grass, leaves, whatever's around you to cook your food. It's very efficient. You do have to be good at building tiny little twig fires so that you can have a fire in all conditions, including rainstorms. But that said, it's a lot of fun to learn how to be good at making fires and to build that as a skill, another another arrow in your quiver, so to speak. One thing about the 180 stoves is that they do not create a push-button fire, so you do have to take the time to build a tiny little fire. It's not hard, but it does take some time. And so some people prefer to have a fuel stove where they can just press a button, light a match. They've got an instant flame. The drawbacks to those, of course, you have to be careful not to spill fuel in the wilderness. And you also have to carry that fuel. You have to figure out how much fuel to carry. You have to uh, keep buying that fuel trip after trip after trip, which adds up. It can get pretty expensive. But it is handy and it is convenient to be able to just push a button. But know what you're doing with your fuels. Some fuels do not burn well in cold conditions. Alcohol fuels do very poorly in the wintertime. Other fuels um, just don't do as well as they could in cold conditions. You also have issues with windy conditions. You name it, make sure that you've done your homework and when you select a way to cook in the woods, that you select something you're comfortable with and that you can enjoy cooking with for years to come. One other advantage of the 180 stoves is that they don't fail. Uh, They're made with no hinges, welds. There are no screws, nuts, bolts, O-rings, rivets to fail in the field. Instead, the pieces are all designed with kind of an ingenious um, tab and slot design that holds the, the stoves together and uh, there are no O-rings that can fail. There's just really nothing that can go wrong. Matter of fact, in the dark, once I stomped one, crushed it, and uh, the next morning I was able to, just with my fingers, bend everything back into shape and cook my breakfast. So that's nice. You step on a lightweight backpacking stove, it's done. You're not going to use it again, and you could find yourself with the inability to cook, which could be a bad thing on a long trip. So you need to have a mess kit with a pan you can cook in. You need to have some way to uh, cook with a stove. And of course, remember to bring a knife. You always need a knife backpacking. 
bring a fork or a spoon or something like that. You could always carve one out of a hunk of wood, but it's nice to have it handy and nearby. So that kind of wraps up the cooking part. Now, lest this show start sounding like nothing but Kurt pontificating about backpacking, I'd like to take a minute to introduce my British daughter from an American mother, Lydia. Hello, Dad. It's quite lovely to be here today. Thank you for having me. So Lydia is here to share some of her ideas about backpacking. She just completed a year with the Outdoor Leadership Program with Jefferson County Public Schools, where they learn tons of outdoor skills and leadership skills and how to lead groups in the wild. Lydia learned backpacking skills. She learned snow camping skills, rock climbing skills, rope skills, group dynamic skills, and many other things. Lydia, what was that program like? The program was absolutely wonderful. It was very instructive on basically everything outdoors. It just gave you a nice introduction so that you could explore different fields of outdoor leadership and see what you would like to do. So we've been thinking about using Lydia's British accent for some of our ads just so it would get your attention. But Lydia, let's get real. Tell us about backpacking with the Outdoor Leadership Program and what you learned from it. So at the beginning of the year, my class took a six-day backpacking trip in the Geneva Creek Basin area where we learned the introduction to leadership skills and basically how to travel in the woods and do a backpacking trip because a lot of the kids in my class had never done anything like that before. They had just grown up in the city and they were all a bit nervous and scared to be out there and It was amazing to see their transformations throughout the course of the year. Well, Lydia, you mentioned how kids were transformed by the program, and I've noticed this. I used to take uh, inner-city kids into the wilderness quite a bit on trips, and some kids, it, it transformed their lives in a really positive way. Other kids had a more difficult time kind of latching on to, I guess, getting that close to nature. And But all of them were heavily impacted by nature, and I think it's because it was such a new experience for them, for one. But for two, when you go out in nature, it removes you from your comfort zone, from all the things that are familiar, right? So what did you see among your peers in the Outdoor Leadership Program? Well, the backpacking trips and the various wilderness trips that we took over the course of the year really helped a lot of kids to open up because... A few of the kids in my class at the beginning of the year, they were really shy and had low self-esteem and didn't really like to talk about their personal lives or their feelings. And by the end of the year, we knew everything about them and our class just became a family. And I believe that the wilderness played a huge role. You know, it creates a a fresh environment for people to explore what's going on and You know, in the last episode when we were talking about backpacking, some people had answered when I asked why backpack, that they did it to learn more about themselves and to find themselves and uh, to kind of get real. I think that's what nature does. Yeah, I agree. And another thing that was amazing about taking the backpacking trips with my class was that there are just some moments around the campfire that everyone will remember for the rest of their lives because we you know it's sort of in just this neutral setting where no one has really been there before and they can just laugh and have a good time with each other and some of the best memories of my life have have transpired around the campfire it is pretty cool you think about it most people spend evenings around the television set let's be real that's what americans do But when you grab a bunch of kids and you put them around a campfire, it's dark outside. There's no TV. You know, the fire itself becomes the centerpiece. But the conversation around the fire just kind of happens. Really cool. Yeah, there are also lots of really fun campfire games that more experienced campers can teach the newer campers. And... Some of them are really funny. It's more for the enjoyment of the older campers, just so that they can see the other people try to figure out what the game is about. And, you know, it's one of those games without any rules or anything, and they just try to figure it out as they go. And that's a lot of great entertainment (laughs) if you're an older camper and you've been doing it for a while. So that's a lot of fun, too. 
one of the reasons I wanted to bring Lydia on was because her perspective of backpacking has a lot to do with the group dynamic and the social aspects of going with a group into the woods. Whereas I've been talking on this show about equipment and tips and tricks and connecting with nature. For Lydia, backpacking had a lot to do with connecting with friends. And I think that that really is a true dynamic. And I would recommend anybody who wants to build friendships to consider getting a group of friends together and going into the woods for a few days. It has an amazing impact. Yeah, I would definitely agree. It just brings you so much closer together than you ever would if you just went out for coffee one morning. It You're just forced to hang out with each other 24-7, and <laughs> during that time you figure out each other's strengths and weaknesses, and you just learn about each other's hearts. And I feel like in this modern day and age, a lot of people just don't really feel like that's necessary and they like to keep what they're feeling really personal and just tucked inside their heart but when you're out in the wilderness and you're stuck with people you sort of learn to trust them and you get to know what they're really like Mm. so you would recommend backpacking to people then absolutely i would yeah it's not always easy but sometimes backpacking is just challenging enough to make it real I think the challenge is part of what makes it work like this. Yeah, definitely. Just going through challenges together is a huge part of building friendships. Lydia, thank you. I just wanted to get your perspective on how nature impacts groups and friendships because I knew that you were the expert on that one. Right. Well, thanks for having me on the show, Dad. Now back to talking about what to do and what to take while backpacking. Let's talk a little bit about food itself. I have tried all sorts of dehydrated, freeze-dried backpacking foods. And some I like better than others. It's a matter of personal taste. They're not horrible. None of them are wonderful either. And usually what you do is you boil water, you pour it into the pouch, you shake it up really, really well, you let it sit for about 10 or 15, maybe even 20 minutes, stir it up, and it's hydrated, and then you eat your meal. Not bad, but after a few days of this, it kind of gets old. So I tend to bring some other foods with me that might be a little bit heavier, but foods that I can eat fresh on the trail. On longer trips, sometimes people will take foods that'll be good for about a day, some things that will keep without refrigeration, and they eat those first, and then, you know, they get to their dehydrated food for the future days on the trail. Another thing that I really like is to know edible wild plants. Don't over harvest an area, but there are ways that you can make little stews and supplement your food with some of the natural edibles. Have to be very careful and really know what you're doing, of course, because some plants out there are poisonous. And we've had a lot of fun eating the occasional fish that we catch, which is nice. Fresh, delicious fish cooked over an open fire. Great source of protein while camping and very delicious. But once again, respect the water. You don't want to be harvesting fish out of an area that's stressed where the fish are struggling to survive or where maybe rare species of fish are living. You know, respect and know what you're doing. But if you're in an area where there are plenty of fish and uh, you're not causing any harm, then wow, what what a delightful thing to have a delicious meal fresh right out of the stream. Here's another tip for you. If you are a lover of your morning coffee, then don't expect to take your creamer with you and your sweetener with you and your coffee and your coffee pot and your espresso machine and all of that. Just forget all that. Go get some instant coffee, and there's some really good types of instant coffee on the market today. So find one you like. Mix in it some powdered milk and maybe some brown sugar or whatever type of sweetener that you like. Put it in a baggie. The whole thing will weigh less than an ounce. You just pour that in your cup, pour in the hot water, you've got your coffee. Everything's all in one place, and it's really light. Makes for a quick, easy cup of coffee, and (laughs) believe me, even if it's not your favorite cup of coffee, on a chilly morning in the woods, it's going to be grand. Another thing to consider about food and backpacking If you're on multi-day trips, longer trips, then you need to start thinking of calories per ounce. That's how much energy do I get per weight of food. And that's why freeze-dried foods are great because they're very, very light and they have plenty of calories. But they do take up quite a bit of space in the pack. And like I said, you're going to get tired of those day after day. So start thinking about other things. They may weigh a little bit more, but if they have lots of calories, then it can still work. Things like peanut butter mixed with butter in it. Maybe mix some honey or some 
jelly directly into the peanut butter. You can even um, add a little bit of oil to it and thin it out or even water to thin it out and put it in a squeeze tube. And then it becomes an energy food that you can squeeze as you hike. Things like that that have a lot of calories. And even though they weigh something, you get a lot of bang for the buck. So that's a, a great trick. Other things are leave the packaging at home. You don't have to backpack a cereal box into the woods, right? Get a little Ziploc or something. Put the cereal that you're going to want in that. Or you can even put the cereal directly in your mess kit. So the next morning, all you have to do is add some powdered milk and water and you have cereal for breakfast. There are lots of ways to avoid having a bulky pack and to avoid having a lot of trash to deal with and to avoid um, carrying a lot of unnecessary weight and waste into the woods. But you know, the bottom line is different people find different foods that work for them. I personally find that I do better with protein and fats for long-term energy than I do a lot of the simple carbohydrates that are in a lot of the, the energy foods today, breakfast bar, and snack bars and things like that. So my preference is to uh, find ways to eat things that are calorie and nutrition dense. And that way, less weight takes you a little farther down the trail. But experiment, see what works for you. And you probably will find those one or two things that you just really love to have in the woods that are worth the weight. Go for it. Carry them. And uh, just enjoy cooking in nature. It's a lot of fun. It's a hobby of its own. You can do all sorts of fun things and innovative things without having to carry a lot of weight once you get started. Now let's talk for a little bit about food storage. My preferred way to carry food in the woods is to have a lightweight a dry sack, a dry bag, and they they make some that are just made out of nylon that has been rubberized a little bit. I'm not talking about the heavy canvas rubberized bags that you might use whitewater rafting or something like that. I'm talking about a bag that weighs just, man, an ounce or two and that can hold a couple of gallons worth of materials. And these bags are awesome because they help to keep the odors down. I also put smelly foods inside of Ziplocs inside of that bag. I also have a large Ziploc for any waste that I have. Um, trash waste, that is. I can put that in a Ziploc. Helps to keep the odors down. The whole point in keeping the odors down is to keep the critters out. And the critters can tear into most anything unless you're going to carry a bear canister with you. And a lot of locations these days recommend or even require that you carry that heavy, big bear canister with you. There's a reason why. It's because people got sloppy with their food Bears became accustomed to eating what people took in with them. They left, people left their trash laying around, bears got into it, and then the bears became a problem. So as they say, a fed bear is a dead bear. The bear canisters are being required in a lot of places just to try to save the bears from interacting with humans on this level. If people would take care of their garbage and take care of their cooking and take care of their smelly foods then that heavy bear canister wouldn't be required. In a lot of areas where the bear canister is not required, practices that you need for taking care of your foods are, number one, don't sleep where you cook. So you want to have a cooking station that's a good distance from your camping area. And if you're in like Colorado where grizzlies are not a problem, then the separation distance doesn't have to be too huge. If you're farther north in grizzly country, then you want to be a good distance away. Um, you got to keep your food separate from from where you sleep at night. Now, that's just smart for your own personal safety. Second thing, do everything you can to minimize odors. So leftover food scraps, um, try to eat all of it first. But if you have leftover food scraps, they need to be buried far away from where you're camping and hopefully deeply enough that they won't attract animals. You need to wash up before you go to bed so you don't smell like the food that you've been cooking, because that's never good. You also can minimize odors by, like I mentioned, making sure that food is as sealed up as possible. And don't think for a second that you can seal it up so well that a bear won't smell it, but you can seal it up well enough that it's not a strong smell and it'll minimize the distance from which it can be smelled. You need to use a bear line if you're not using a bear canister. 
And even if you're not in bear country, a bear line keeps raccoons and things out of your food as well. So uh, 180 Tech also sells a bear line utility system that is far superior to any other bear line system that we have found. It has a heavy safety throw bag made out of Cordura. It doesn't weigh a lot, but it's heavy duty so that you can put a rock in it and throw a line over a tree limb without banging the rock in your head. It comes with two pieces of 550 paracord, so it's very stout, and that way you can go from tree to tree with a drop line in the middle, and then, here's the kicker, it has two climbing rated carabiners that you can use to hoist very heavy loads up on your drop line in between two trees. So we're not talking about, oh, I hung my food from a tree limb where any animal that can climb a tree will get to it. Now we're talking about food suspended 20 feet above the ground between trees. Um, Very difficult for any animal to get out there and get into it. Not that it's impossible, but it discourages it greatly With the two carabiners, you can make a block and tackle system with mechanical advantage. And I have lifted packs and food for, you know, eight, nine people up on these. It is a a very stout system. Matter of fact, so stout, it can be used for other functions as well. Uh, We've used it for motorcycle recovery. When you find your motorcycle down in some gully somewhere. We've also used the bear lines for dragging canoes out of the water. And of course, with a paracord, You can use that paracord for anything that you might use paracord for in the woods, including um, emergency situations. Very, very useful. The bear line can suspend the food in a place where the bears just can't get at it. And if people take care to make sure that their food is out of animals' reach, then increasing requirements for things like bulky, heavy bear canisters will be minimized. That way, it becomes a little bit easier for all of us to get into the woods and to take care of nature. Now back to how to pack for a backpacking trip. Remember, I said, think about everything that you're going to do in a normal day, and that will tell you uh, everything that you're going to need. So I already mentioned the toothbrush when you brought up the food. So toiletries, what are you going to need for that? Um, I keep it really, really simple. A toothbrush, I like to have a little squeeze tube of biodegradable soap. Of course, I like to have some toilet paper. There are probably some toiletries that you use at home that you are not going to need on a backpacking trip. For instance, depending on the length of the trip, you can leave the shaving cream, the razor, all that kind of stuff at home. You also don't need toothpaste. Toothpaste is just a bare attractant. So when it comes to toothpaste, all I do is fill my mouth with water and then brush really, really well with a toothbrush. And that gets the mouth really clean. Matter of fact, you might be surprised, depending on how you use your toothpaste, sometimes it gets in the way of the toothbrush and actually your mouth is not as clean with toothpaste. Shampoo is a rule not needed. Your biodegradable squeeze tube of soap is going to be adequate to keep your uh, your hair clean as well as your body. And, and if it's not the right solution for you, then find the right solution. There are plenty of things out there that are biodegradable and that you can wash your hair and your body with. So another thing is strongly perfumed toiletries are a no-no. They attract critters, especially bears, to your pack. It's just going to be a problem. Get stuff that's natural. Don't worry about smelling like a department store where you're in the woods. Instead, just stay clean and think minimal. So as I'm going through my typical day, right, I am getting out of bed. Well, that's my sleep system we already talked about. I have some sort of a shelter that I'm crawling out of, whether that's a tarp or a tent. We've already talked about that. I'm putting on my boots. We've already talked about footwear. I'm going to eat my breakfast. We have already talked about food. I'm going to want to brush my teeth and wash up, and we've talked about toiletries. I'm going to want to make sure I'm protected from the sun because it's going to get really glaring at times. And we've already talked about sunscreen and clothing to protect you from the sun. Spring is here and camping season is upon us. Visit our site at 180tech.com for your next camp stove. The 180 stove and smaller 180 flame are combustible fuel stoves, which are designed to burn the fuel that nature provides you at your campsite. There's no need to lug heavy and bulky fuel canisters along with you on the trail. The 180 Flame and 180 Stove are built in America and have no moving parts to fail you in the field. Check them out at www.180tack.com. Your purchase helps support the Adventure Sports Podcast. (music) 
we've also talked about cooking food, your camp stove, your mess kit that you might need. And then I like to think about entertainment. I love to go to a destination and spend a whole day there before I move on to the next place. It just changes the the pace of the trip, and it's a real luxury to be able to do that. Now, through hikers rarely get to. They would call that a zero day because they don't make any distance. I like zero days a lot. So what am I going to do on a zero day? I think about entertainment. I might have a, a paperback book. I might have a book on my cell phone that I carry with me. And as a rule, I, my cell phone's turned off. I only take it to take pictures and maybe to read a book. Um, I will take a Frisbee often. And the reason is that a Frisbee can be used for a variety of different things. Uh, obviously, you can play Frisbee with it, but we also use Frisbees as plates. You can use it as a cutting board. You can use it to fan a flame if you're trying to start a fire. I've even used a Frisbee as a way to leave a message for others who are meeting me in the woods. You stick a Frisbee on a tree and you write a message on it with a pen or a piece of charcoal. It's hard to miss. But really, when it comes to entertainment, my favorite entertainment when I'm in the woods is working on bushcraft skills or just enjoying my surroundings, going on day hikes, maybe taking a swim in an icy lake. Finding a place where you can climb up on a high spot and perch and just watch the world go around. Sometimes I'll take a field guide because it's fun to learn about the different animals and plants that are around you. And it's a great time to identify edible wild plants. I wouldn't try eating them in the woods if you're unfamiliar with them, but it's a great time to have a field guide and to learn more about them. And, you know, sometimes fishing is something that we like to do. But the bottom line is... You can be thoroughly entertained just by nature around you, if you know what that is. Sometimes my kids and I will build sculptures out of mud or sculptures out of little twigs and and uh, pine cones and things that we find laying around. That kind of stuff is uh, it's centering. It kind of slows life down and allows you to see the details and to appreciate the pace of nature instead of the pace of of society. Now for the second break, I wanted to depart a little bit from all the talk about the details of backpacking to ask Caleb a few questions. Caleb is my oldest son and the first of the kids to start backpacking with me. And we've had, wow, a lot of great trips. Caleb, I know that you're a lot like I am in that when you go into nature, uh, it, it gives you an opportunity to kind of recenter and reconnect and, and uh, rejuvenate yourself. And backpacking is kind of an extended trip to do just that. So tell us how that feels when you go into nature and, and what that's all about for you. Well, it actually takes a little bit more time for me to recenter myself. I usually don't feel recentered completely until I've been in the woods for about three days, and that allows enough time for time to actually slow down to the pace of nature. Well, let's talk a little bit about a, a couple of the trips that we've been on. Um, we went into a really remote area once. It was probably your first big backpacking trip. It was so remote, matter of fact, that we saw an animal there that a lot of people would say doesn't exist in Colorado, but we know it does. What was that about? Yeah, so uh, it was in Holy Cross Wilderness, and we were in this valley that was, as Dad said, really remote, and it had a lot of trees that were uh, had a diameter of, I don't know, six to eight feet, and they were all laying on top of each other. And so we were going through this thick undergrowth of trees, basically balancing from tree to tree because you couldn't walk on the ground between them. Um, and as we were doing that, I caught something out of the corner of my eye, and I looked over, and I saw the tail end of a wolverine vanish out of sight. And at first I was like, what was that? And then... Then I thought, well, Dad and I both thought about it, and we were like, well, it could have been a badger maybe or a fox. And I thought, well, no, it just it didn't look right. It looked like something I'd never seen before, and as it turns out, it was a wolverine. And later we looked up how many wolverines are in the Rocky Mountains in the United States, in the continental United States, and it turns out that there are as few as two known wolverines. I think it's kind of fun when you go out into nature and you're surprised by the unexpected. When I was a kid, I spent, wow, every hour that I could in the woods growing up in Oklahoma. And 
this is for, you know, 18 years of romping and stomping through the woods. One day, one time, I saw a jackrabbit. A jackrabbit, in contrast to a cottontail, which were everywhere. But, you know, jackrabbits in the southwestern United States are fairly common. And I had heard that they existed around where I grew up in northeastern Oklahoma. But there was only one time in 18 years tens of thousands of hours in the woods that I saw a jackrabbit. And those those moments are just kind of magical. I think that's part of the reason why we go into nature, why we go into the woods, why we backpack, is because those sorts of things happen. And you go, wow, and if you, if you stayed home, it never would have happened. Caleb, I mentioned in part one of this two-part series that people backpack for a lot of reasons. And one of those reasons is, you know, the macho, let's see how many miles I can go, or to challenge oneself to go out into the unknown and experience something. And some people do it to connect with nature. Some people do it because they love the, the pace of backpacking. I think that there is many reasons to backpack as there are people who backpack, but why do you like to backpack? Well, I like to backpack, as I said before, because it recenters myself and it allows enough time for that to completely happen. Uh, it also allows me time to think about whatever whatever might appeal to me at the time. And then also just exploring new things, uh, seeing new sights, uh, experiencing new experiences. I've gone on several backpacking trips to the same location, but I've never been on a backpacking trip that was exactly the same. They're all different. They all have their highs and their lows, and that's part of what makes backpacking so interesting and so rejuvenating is that it's not boring. Um, it keeps you entertained. It, um, it also keeps you alert because you don't know what is around the next bin. You don't know what's waiting for you, whether that's strange weather or a beautiful view. You just don't know, and that's part of the thrill of it. So it's the exploration and the adventure then. Sure, yeah. You know, one thing that I've always been impressed with about the way that you backpack is, you know, you have a pretty heavy load, and we go over some tough, steep, high-altitude terrain. You never complain. You always just muscle right through it. And I'm impressed by your stamina. you have any secrets or advice for people who, you know, when they get to that part where just, they just don't want to go anymore, how they can keep on going like you do? It's a mind game. Like a lot of other sports, backpacking is an endurance sport. Uh, a great way to prepare for that is to go running or mountain biking or just, you know, take a walk a few times a week. Um, and what I mean by mind game is that you reach a certain point where you think, okay, I've got to stop. I'm too tired. I can't go on. But if you keep on going, then you won't get any more tired than you are at that moment. And you can keep on going at your current pace for hours the entire day without stopping and that's really how I do it um, you should be going slow enough that your individual legs can rest in between steps but just keep going and you'll cover a lot of distance and then another side to it is what some people do is they think of only the trail in front of them they think of only the next step to get to their destination and really that's self-defeating because you're thinking about how tired you are it, what really helps is if you distract yourself by looking around you and taking in the wonderful landscapes that you're traveling through Caleb we have been a lot of places and and had a lot of amazing experiences out in the woods we've summited 14ers in rain snow fog sunshine you name it and uh, we've had a lot of high moments and some really challenging moments too. Can you think of a moment that just kind of blew you away that you could tell us about? Uh, which one? Um, one time my dad and I took a weekend trip to climb a few 14ers. We climbed a Huron and Missouri. And Missouri was interesting because... We woke up that morning and there was cloud cover everywhere. But my dad looked at the clouds and he thought, well, they don't look like thunderheads. And so we decided to go until it was no longer safe to keep going. And as we traveled through up, up to the top of Missouri, well, we started traveling through the clouds. And it was just amazing because the clouds would swoop in and out of the mountain valleys and create weird shapes out of the rock outcroppings and things like that. And then what was also amazing about it is we finally, when we got to the top, the clouds broke out a little bit and we were able to see the fantastic 14er view we had been unable to see up until that point. And that entire trip was really magical for me. 
it was so unique and it was really otherworldly. There were so many odd shapes and the, um, things like that. It was also very peaceful because I don't know if you've ever walked in fog, but there's no wind at all. The sunshine is gone. It's just very cool and you feel like you're floating. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's funny that you use the word otherworldly because I have felt that way so many times, but the reality is this is the world. It's the real part of the world that most people miss if they don't get out there and see what's going on, right? And just the experiences that you can have, there are so many indescribable things that happen when you get out and experience, you know, face to face, touch to touch, sound to sound, smell to smell, what this planet really is all about. And what you describe about climbing Missouri in the fog, um, it did seem like you could be on another planet. But the reality is, that's a real world. That's where we live. And I think it's so cool that those opportunities are available to anybody who's willing to go out and experience them. Caleb, what advice do you have for people who have not been backpacking before? Is it worth the effort? Do you think people should give it a shot? Yes, I do. I think that it surprises a lot of uh, people who have never done it before just how difficult it, it really is. And often when I've taken inexperienced backpackers out, they don't want to continue, but you have to, you know, sort of coax them. And then once we get to wherever we're going, then all of a sudden something clicks and they're, they're like, oh, I understand now why this is fun, why it's worth it. And then you keep on interacting with them and showing them, you know, the ways to make the hard parts easier and make everything interesting. And a lot of it is just showing them how to interact with nature and how to constantly be soaking it in like a sponge. Um, and really, that's my advice to new backpackers that have never tried it before is give it a fair chance. Don't give up right away. And... Try to take everything in all at once. Try to overwhelm yourself. Try to purposefully overwhelm yourself with the things that's happening around you, and you'll be amazed by what you discover. Good words, dude. So thanks for sharing with us, and thanks for being on. Yeah, it was a pleasure. So there are two more things that I am sure to do when I am in the woods. I need to be able to build fires, and I need to be able to purify water because you have to have lots of water, and perhaps the fire is the way to purify the water. But since I always use a 180 stove when I go backpacking, building a little fire is going to be critical. So what do I use for my fire building? I've practiced my skills. I take a little bit of fire still, and that's really all I need. With a fire still, I can always find tinder that'll catch a spark and start a fire. But sometimes if I'm in a hurry and conditions are a little damp, then rather than going to the trouble of uh, finding some dry tinder, I will use a little bit of that rubbing alcohol just to get a couple of twigs going. But really, for me, that's all I need. Other people prefer a lighter. Lighters don't always work. They can fail. Matches are a good backup. I don't use matches, but you know, if you have some waterproof matches down in your pack somewhere in an emergency, that can be pretty valuable. But for me, it's just a good fire still. That's all you really need once you understand how to make fires. And when it comes to purifying water, different options are out there. I have used the iodine tablets. Don't really like the taste. I have used filter systems. That's my preferred method, but that does mean you're going to have to carry a filter and pump water. There are gravity flow filter systems, which are awesome because you scoop up a gallon and a half of water, hang it on a tree limb, and it filters automatically. I love those, except you need to find one that has a decent filter that doesn't clog up quickly. And for some reason, those that I've tried are only good for about one trip before their flow turns into a drip. So I, uh, I really like those, but someone needs to come out with a reliable filter for them. Other ways to purify water. Uh, ultraviolet stirring sticks have become popular lately. So if you have water that's that's fairly clean already, maybe even you pour it through a cloth to get some of the grit out of it, then you can stir that water with this ultraviolet stick and it kills all the pathogens. At least it's purported to kill all the path pathogens. And uh, I believe it works. We've used those some and those are handy and quick. They don't require a lot of effort. They do require batteries. For, for me, that's a major drawback. 
because anything that requires batteries, of course, means that you have the risk of batteries going dead. I don't like things that run out when I'm backpacking in the woods. That's why I prefer using a natural fuel stove. I don't want to run out of fuel. I don't like to uh, have to depend solely on flashlights because I don't like to run out of batteries for a flashlight. Matter of fact, if I do take a flashlight with me, I often take a solar-powered flashlight. Pretty cool. You set it in the sun, it recharges, and then that evening you have all the light you need till morning. So pretty neat things. Um, Other water filtration systems. There are ways to filter water even if you have nothing. Survival techniques that you can use to filter and purify water. But the bottom line is, if you're caught in a bind, you can filter water through some cloth, you can boil it, and there are different recommendations on how long to boil water. At sea level, if the water comes to a rolling boil, you're done. But when you get up to altitude, people say, add a minute for every thousand feet. And I don't know if that's really necessary, but uh, it's not a bad idea. So if you're at 10,000 feet, that would be 10 minutes of boiling. And the reason, of course, for that is that the boiling point, the temperature at which water boils, drops as you go up in altitude, so the water doesn't get as hot. And so boiling it a little bit longer um, guarantees that you're killing all the pathogens. Now, boiled water tastes kind of funny. One thing that you can do to help that, of course, is to make a tea or something like that out of it. Um, But another thing you can do is put it in a water bottle that's maybe only two-thirds full and shake it really well. Because as you shake it, you re-oxygenate it, and that makes the water taste a lot better. And as my kids would tell you, pine needle tea is also a lot of fun. If you chop up some pine needles and boil them in the water for a little while, it makes a high vitamin C, delicious morning drink. It's energizing. And, of course, it uh, takes that boiled flavor out of the water. So that can be really enjoyable, especially if you can put a little squeeze of honey in it. Some other items that you might consider taking on a backpacking trip, though not absolutely necessary, would be some sort of a lightweight camera. I often just use my cell phone. My smartphone does pretty much everything I need in the woods. But if you're a photography buff, then of course you're going to want to take some heavier camera gear into the woods. But as John Fielder said, as we interviewed him in in previous episodes, digital camera quality, digital photography has come so far Now digital images can be even better than film, and it's amazing. But the digital equipment is a whole lot lighter. The technology behind the the lenses has made things lighter and more compact. You can actually carry some amazing photography equipment into the woods with you now without a huge weight sacrifice. But of course, if you're going to take electronics into the woods, you have to worry about those dreaded batteries again running out. And here's a tip for your smartphone users Have your phone fully charged up, and when you get out of the car, then turn off all the network connections. You don't need a a cell phone network. You don't need Wi-Fi. You don't need Bluetooth. You can even turn the GPS off and just turn it on if you need it. And by doing that, not keeping your screen on all the time, your cell phone will probably last you for two or three days or more before it needs a charge. When it comes to other electronics and recharging batteries, there are a lot of really good little photovoltaic cells that you can buy now that are really light that you can put on your pack and charge things with. So there's an option. If you are seriously wanting to have some electronics with you, you can do that. But frankly, I prefer to leave most of the electronics at home. I just take the cell phone so that I can take pictures and maybe read a little bit. I think that journaling in the woods can be wonderful because you can record your experiences. Maybe you get inspired to write a little poetry or something. So take a lightweight notebook and a pencil or a pen. That can be a lot of fun. So think about the things that you love to do that don't require going to the mall or driving a car or using those sort of modern devices. And generally, you should be able to do it in the woods and then find a way to do it lightweight and you're good to go. That's kind of the last level of thought process for me when I'm planning a backpacking trip is uh, what do I want to do to have fun while I'm there? And frankly, rarely do I have time to just have fun. Usually I'm having my fun just by taking care of camp and doing the things around there that are necessary or by carrying my gear from one place to another. It's just such a blast to get out there, 
to see the scenery, you know, to experience nature on that level. And it's so much fun. Rarely am I ever looking for other ways to be entertained. One last thing that we always need to take into account when we're headed into the woods is can we find our way to where we want to go and can we find our way back out again? And I like to say you're never really lost in the woods if you're not on some sort of a time crunch and if you have the skills to stay in the woods indefinitely, then you might not know exactly where you are, but that doesn't mean that you're in a bad situation. If you're prepared, then nature is uh, is your sustainer. But that said, here's one example. My uh, oldest son and I, when he was just getting started backpacking, went on a backpacking trip deep into the Holy Cross wilderness, and we wanted to find a lake. I had been there years previous, but I had not been there in uh, in quite some while. So I went in with a, a simple like satellite image that we printed out, and I thought, well, that'll be good enough. And we got to a point where we had to leave the trail to go down to the lake, and we dropped into this valley and came to a creek. And I knew, well, this creek either feeds the lake or comes out of the lake. And it looked like, by the lay of the land, that there wasn't enough terrain upstream for the lake to be there. So we headed downstream. And hours upon hours upon hours, and we realized, finally, we had hiked a long distance out of the way. The lake had to have been upstream. And it was all because I didn't have a proper map, and so our guesswork was wrong. Now, we had a delightful time. It was absolutely beautiful, and we loved where we ended up staying and backpacking. The point is that had I had an adequate map and taken the time to grab a compass to find a, shoot a bearing or two and find our location, or maybe even use a GPS, then we would have known to go upstream, and we would have arrived at the lake. Regardless, it was a beautiful trip. But the point is this, it's worthwhile to have a good map, it's worthwhile to know how to use a compass to figure out where you are, doing a little triangulation, and it's also good to have GPS skills. These days, GPS is heavily leaned upon by an awful lot of people to find their way around in the woods because it's so exact and so easy to use. I think that's great, you know? But again, dreaded batteries and electronics that can fail... I've even had times when getting a good GPS reading is difficult, but if you have a compass and a map and you know how to use it, then you don't need the GPS. So, you know, the map and the compass, you're going to have the map anyway. The compass weighs almost nothing. Throw it in your pack and have the knowledge in your head that weighs nothing but can save your life. Then you can take your GPS in, but you don't have to rely on it if things go wrong. Always have that map. It's worth it. You can have a lot more fun if you know where you are and you know how to get to where you're going. Wow, it's amazing to me how long it takes to go through even just the surface details of backpacking. But we've gone full length again today, and I'm going to call that the end of this segment on backpacking. And of course, the Adventure Sports Podcast revisits backpacking from time to time as we interview amazing guests about their backpacking trips, their through hikes, their mountaineering climbs, those sorts of things. If you love backpacking, then we have lots and lots of episodes on backpacking, which you can find at the adventuresportspodcast.com. You can go into the episode categories and do a control F, that's a control find. And type in the word backpacking and they will pop right up so that you can enjoy those shows. Thank you again for your time today. I hope that you learned a couple of tips that can help you with your backpacking. Or if you're a beginner, that you learned the necessities that can get you started, that can get you out there enjoying the wilderness and having tons of fun. Backpacking is one of my very favorite things to do, obviously. And I would encourage anybody to try it. Just remember... Figure out how to pack light. Take only the things that you really, really need. Leave everything else at home. Nature will do the rest for you. And as always, get out there and have some fun. Join us on Monday when we hear from Kathy Dalton. GoAdventureMom.com. All about adventuring with your family.